The preservation of food is nothing new. Throughout all of human history, we've been looking for ways to keep the food we obtain from spoiling, rotting, or decaying because the more efficiently we use our food, the less we have to work for it. From pickling and salting to smoking and drying, we've always sought out ways to make it last days, weeks, months, or even years. One of the more recent advancements in human history has come from one of the most often overlooked sides to war supplying troops. Soldiers need food. They need energy to fight the battles they engage in. This need would lead to the invention of canning food. But what's interesting is how, even beyond the inception of the idea, the advancements and innovations to the technology have continuously had an inextricable link with war. So let's crack open a can of knowledge as we learn something new. In 1795, the French government was fighting battles in Italy, the Netherlands, Germany, and the Caribbean as they were coming out of the French Revolution and fighting with many of their neighbors as part of the French Revolutionary Wars. Less than a decade before Napoleon would rise to power, France was already looking to expand their control and ideology throughout the world. But they were running into some problems. Namely, their soldiers were getting hungry, and they didn't have a reliable way to get fresh food to their their troops, and their fronts were beginning to suffer from it. The French leaders of the time decided to offer a 12,000 franc reward for anyone who could provide a breakthrough in the preservation of food. Many took on the challenge, but one was determined to win. Nicolas Appert, a young chef who had worked for French nobility, threw himself into the study of food preservation. He found that there were several problems with the traditional methods of preservation at the time. Drying out the food could change the taste and make the food hard to the point that it was difficult to chew. And excessively salting the food to preserve it could make it borderline indigestible. For years, he experimented with new methods and containers, trying to find a balance between preserving the food without it becoming a detriment to the quality and nutrition. It wasn't until 1810, 14 years after first taking on the challenge, that Nicholas Appert sent glass containers with a top sealed with wax and wire into the French government. It was able to preserve soups, fruits, vegetables, and more some of which could be stored and eaten after months of storage. Sailors that received the containers sent back word that they loved Appert's products, saying they were able to enjoy broths with boiled beef, beans, and green peas, all with the freshness and flavor of freshly picked vegetables. After receiving the prize money for his invention, Appert went on to turn his workshop from a tiny room where he spent over a decade tinkering with designs into a large factory that employed 40 people to prepare and package food during the summer when the food was grown while a separate shop sold them. He would later publish a book that detailed how he was just as impressed with his factory as he was with the canning method itself. He had divided the room into four sections. In the first section, all substances from animal to broth were prepared for preservation by a multitude of kitchen essentials. The second section had substances like milk, cream, and whey carefully prepared for their preservation. In the third section, after substances going into the jars had been readied, the bottles were corked. Finally, in the fourth section, heat was applied with three large copper boilers in a water bath fashion to the corked glass vessels. His methods were hailed by the press of the time, especially as he began to expand his operations beyond military use and began selling to the citizens, as the papers would claim that Appert was able to conquer the seasons, claiming that spring, summer, and autumn lived in his bottles. The positive press convinced Appert that more people should have access to such a revolutionary way of preserving food. So in 1810, he published a book called The Art of Preserving, all kinds of animal and vegetable substances for several years. It was in this book he shared in detail all of his methods so that the common man could preserve food within their home, even without a patent and going as far as to put his address at the end of the book so that skeptics of the methods he used could come to his house and try the preserved food for themselves. Yet, despite the apparent altruism of Appert's book, an English merchant later that year would file a patent for a canning process that was remarkably similar to Appert's. Peter Durand, who claimed he developed the idea himself, went on to sell his method to engineers in England for thousands of pounds. 
Although it's debated whether or not Duran stole Appert's idea, what is clear is that for many years after, Duran would continue to take the idea and improve upon it further. While Appert's process used glass containers, Duran would experiment with other materials, sending the traditional glass containers on a voyage across the ocean with others that used tin cans. Upon the voyage's return in 1813, the captain reported that the food was equally good throughout the trip. Even better, the cans were considerably lighter than the glass jars, intended to be less fragile. The canned food was becoming so popular that in June of 1813, King George III and Queen Charlotte were excited to be served canned beef. After, Durand would sell his patent to a man named Brian Duncan, a man who would work to produce the cans on a larger scale. King George III was enthusiastically asking for the canned food to be put on their military ships. And so, the invention originally intended for the French was being used for the British. And it wouldn't be long before the cans would make their way to America as well, with Thomas Kinsent and Ezra Daggart starting to sell canned oysters, fruits, vegetables, and meats to New Yorkers as early as 1825. But canned food's historical entanglement with war would continue, because despite some usage for the California Gold Rush, its use really wouldn't truly catch on until the American Civil War. More astonishing is, despite it having been around for over half a century at this point, the first can opener wasn't invented until 1860 by Ezra Warner. Before this, people tended to open the metal cans with a hammer and chisel or a knife, with early soldiers using the bayonets on their rifles to break open the cans. Even so, the early can opener was mainly only used throughout the Civil War and then later by shop clerks or restaurants. A more user-friendly can opener that was commercially available wouldn't come around until the 1920s, after the USDA began advising people on how they should can their own food at home. This became extremely prevalent during World War I, with at-home canning exploding throughout Europe and America, especially as food rations were put into effect. Sugar, being highly sought out and harshly rationed during World War II, would be given to households that were canning food for the war effort. Though, when rationing went away after the war, so did much of the at-home canning populace. The commercialization of canning would only grow, though. There have been many inventions and innovations developed from the needs only war can exacerbate. Yet, it's rare to be able to see something seemingly so disconnected from the act of fighting itself have a history so intertwined with the history of death and destruction. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, it would mean a lot if you could leave a like below, as it helps the algorithm find more people who would find it interesting as well. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.